listening to the Good Morning Show. We're back. That's right. Welcome back, New Orleans, to the Good Morning Show. It's your boy, the Prof, holding it down, man. Shout out to my brother, OT. Be back on Thursday. But until then, you all are stuck with me. That's right. And man, I, I just had a therapy session. Uh, I look like I'm getting ready to go into another one. Uh, we got on the line. We got Dr. Denise Shervington on the line with us. The B-Side Healing is a Revolution psychiatrist. Good morning, Dr. Shervington. Good morning, Prof. How are you? I am well this morning. Um, I, I am I am receiving all of my social services right here on the morning show this morning, Dr. Sheridan. That's great. Yeah, I see why you work. That's great. Yeah, I just I just I just had a wonderful conversation with Mr. Victor Sims of Sims Social Services, who's a behavioral specialist. Um, uh-huh. We were talking about the five stages of loss. Um, okay. And so, uh, yeah, we, we talk frequently, just as we do with you. Nice. And so mm-hmm. I, I think that, that Lee purposely and OT purposely scheduled this because OT is not here today. It's just me and you, Dr. Shervening. But I think they scheduled this because they wanted to make sure that I, I received and I, I had conversations with people that I really needed to talk with. Yeah. <laughs> and I also think that, you know, it's helpful to your listening audience. I think what we're trying to do in this conversation, these conversations, is to say it's okay to have struggles in life. We all do. Some of us even experience traumas. The important thing is to know how to admit one's vulnerability that one is hurting and then, you know, to seek help. And it goes anyway from talking to friends for some people talking to their faith leader. For some people, it's, you know, having mental, traditional mental health supports. There are other things we can do that help us to heal, like being in nature. So I think we're just trying to normalize that no one goes through life without having mental health struggles. And the thing to do is to be able to recognize it, and in particular, if it's not making you function well. And there is help for everyone, and there are multiple ways we can heal. But I think I think in the African-American community, Dr. Shervington, that I think that, that we have, there's a misconception that, that if you talk to, if you, if you go and see a mental health professional, that you crazy, you know, that there's something mm-hmm. seriously wrong with you. And we, we give you a stigma. You know, you have to wear a scarlet letter, you know, of, of being certifiably crazy. And, you know, but but in all actuality, it, it is it is part of the natural processes, I think, is what you're saying. Yeah. And, you know, let me destigmatize stigma, because sometimes we tend to blame ourselves and say, you know, we have this issue. I just want to take us down a little memory lane about, you know, our history of oppression. In Louisiana, in the 1800s, a psychiatrist coined the term dreptomania. Any slaves who were trying to run away, they were labeled crazy. And then when they were caught, they were beaten oftentimes to death, that they were beating the devil out of us. And over years, the decades, the centuries, whenever we had mental health problems, we were criminalized and we were sent to these awful places. So the word gets into the community that this is not, you don't want to admit that there's something going on because the way the system treated you was so inhumane. So I, you know, a lot of times I'm asked to talk about stigma and I need to hold up that it's not just all us. There were forces around us that made it really, really challenging to admit that you were having mental health problems. Now, Dr. Sheraton, you, you're the president of the Institute for Women in Ethics Studies at the Charles Drew University of Medicine and Science. What what role? Um, because oftentimes our our African-American women. Right. And and mm-hmm. and I use the term, if you notice, I, I, I use the term black sometimes, but. Yes. I had this whole conversation where I don't want to be seen as a color, that I want you to acknowledge my ethnicity. 
And the only way that I can do that, just like we do with Latin Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans, is that I refer to my Africanism by having you say African American. So that's just my personal preference. And when I use the color black, you know, we use black doing black power and stuff like that. I use it intentionally, but that's just me. So anyway, what 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 role does um, healing our African American women play in the advancement of us as a people? Yeah, let me just correct one thing. The okay. Institute of Women and Ethnic Studies is separate from Charles. Oh, I'm sorry. University. I'm sorry. I had it together. No, no, that's fine. It's very easy to conflate them. And Charles Lou is a historically black university, yes. a medical school, a nursing school, and also a Hispanic serving institution. Getting back to, you know, the issue of African-American women healing, it's really important, but it also, we need African-American men to heal. We need to heal together. And at at IWES, we call the Institute IWES. We, you know, we focus our programs on families, on women in particular, but we also do, do a lot of work with men because we have to heal. And in fact, on the podcast that we released on Tuesday, we have an African-American male and we have an African-American female. So it's if one of us is okay and the other isn't, together it's really hard to be in a collective. And, but, but but so often we we treat them as, as, as being different. And in fact, right. um, so often we're pitted against one another. Mm-hmm. You know, you have mm-hmm. you have African-American men angry with African-American women, you know, about their situation. And you have African-American women angry with African-American men about not stepping up and being there and doing all the things that, that they feel that a man is supposed to do. So how mm-hmm. how do we begin to bridge the, the divide between the two so that we could move forward as a people? I think exactly what you're doing to state we have a problem. We can't fix things unless we know, okay, there are some problems. It's been brewing for a while. Um, we were always pitted against each other. You know, there are many ways we're pitted gender, we're pitted against color, we're pitted against each other with our hair texture. There has always been a conquer and divide um, situation for us, people who are marginalized and oppressed, and we're going to have to take control and say, this is not how we want to be. We all do well when each one of us is doing okay. If one group within the African-American community is okay, but the other is not, it's not going to help us. So so right and, now, right now, Dr. Sherrington, we're at a pivotal moment um, in history, socially, right? We've, we, people mm-hmm. have referred to this as being the year of the woman. And, and I guess they say that because women have been breaking barriers and, and excelling. Looks like everything that they touch you know, they, they're successful at and being elevated um, socially, being elevated uh, job wise. So how, how do we how do we overcome that as an African-American male? Right. It's easy for me to say. Um, and we saw this. We actually saw this happen in our local elections. We saw people mm-hmm. concede the election just for the just just have, after having made the runoff, say that I don't think I can beat her. And, and that has to do something to our mental psyche. When we as a man um, or men say, um, I'm not going to even try because I, I don't think I can beat her because it's the year of the woman. I think these things are artificially created to divide us. This is not necessarily the year of the woman. It's never been the year of the black woman. Oftentimes we have had to turn up and work extra hard. And I and oftentimes when we turn up, we take our men with us. We, I, the majority of successful black women that I know, if we're just going to talk about material or professional success, are oftentimes very committed to their partners, their spouses. And I don't think they, there is any pity in that if we succeed, it's not at the expense of our men. And this is this false myth we need to get rid of. If black women are being successful, then black men can also be successful. Do what the black women are doing if that's the situation. But it doesn't mean because a black woman is successful that black men can't be successful. 
And, you know, I just feel that these are messages to divide us because we are weakest when we are being divided. So how 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 do we overcome? You you mentioned something. You mentioned material or professional success. So are there any? Is there any other type of success that we should be looking at outside of material? Or because we know that these are the, materialism is real, especially in the African American community. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what should our focus actually be? Kind of what I'm, you know, kind of here to talk about is our mental well being. It doesn't matter. We're traveling through life from birth to death. And materials might seemingly help us, but it doesn't make us happy. And I think we're, I would like to think we're aiming to find some balance in our mind to feel good about our situation, to feel good about the life we've created for ourselves. And it doesn't have to be having extreme amounts of wealth or not. And I think in this kind of capitalist society, we've gotten things twisted. I, as a doctor, I have seen people get sick and die. And when they're dying, the most important thing to them is to feel they've been loved and they loved and that there are people who turn up for them. It did not matter how much money they had. And so, of course, to seemingly be okay in this more capitalist society, we need to have access to money and materials, but it's not the end all and be all of a life well spent, a life well lived. Or you can have a lot of money and if your mind is right, it's not going to help you. And so what I think myself and many people, African Americans, Black in the mental health field is trying to say, let's start the process of healing. And Healing is a Revolution, which is a podcast, really shares stories of people who have made it through struggles, came out on the other side. And we're hoping that when people hear these stories, they can connect and tap into their own resilience. That's what's important, to wake up in the morning and feel pretty okay about life, to feel you have the resources, the cap- and I'm talking about mental resources, to make it through. Because life is hard. It's not easy. It's not easy to turn up and face the days, especially in the conditions we're living in now. So what's important is to find a way to be at peace and to not suffer. We have pain, but how do we not suffer through our pain? How do we turn up for ourselves and for each other? To me, that's what a life well lived is about, not about the things you amassed. Because oftentimes that's about luck and sometimes, you know, having friends in the right place. So, so Dr. Shervington, it was uh, Carrie Tubman is credited with having said that I freed a thousand slaves, and but I could have freed a thousand more if only they knew they were slaves. So, one of the things that that I'm most mm-hmm. interested in, and and I'm trying to wrap my head around is, is how do we break the mentality that has been instilled in us for so many years, um, so that we can understand that mentally we are free. We're free to live the same American dream that everyone else lives, that we can, we can mentally, we can heal. How, how, do, how do we get to that point? I can also add what Bob Marley said. You know, we have to free our minds, that only we can free ourselves. And I think it begins with naming that we have not been free, that the forces around us externally have tried to dehumanize us, take away our freedoms. I mentioned earlier Samuel Cartwright, the physician in Louisiana in the 1800s, whenever a slave tried to run away, called us crazy. So we have to recognize that there have been these forces against us. We have to realize how resilient we've been, that we have made it to this point, and then we have to begin the process of our own healing which begins with just saying sometimes, you know, I'm hurting and beginning to spend more time when we're reflective, when we understand what is this hurt about. We have to name it and we need to understand how is it turning up in me. I oftentimes say to my African-American 
persons that I serve is oftentimes we have to take a little journey backwards because the way our personality was formed, meaning how we view ourselves, how we view each other, how we view the world, was very much shaped by the early years in our lives. And so we have to take a little bit, a little journey back there and understand those forces. What was happening into our home? The question I ask, and I always ask it on Healing is the Revolution podcast, and also in the book, is into what circumstances were you born? We need to understand our foundation. So if there are things that were painful, that were hurtful, if there were needs we didn't have met, then as adults, we can do the work of healing that space. If you're just joining the conversation, we're talking to Dr. Denise Sherrington, um, psychiatrist, uh, about our podcast, The B-Sides, Healing is a Revolution. Um, I got a question for you, Dr. Sherrington. Sure. What does it mean when we say someone has been traumatized? What, what, does, what does it mean when we use, because we, use, we hear that word used a lot, and you just mentioned um, acknowledging the situation and circumstances into which you were born. So is it, is it possible that we have individuals that are born into a very traumatic situation? If, if, what does it mean when we, when we, say, when we use the word sure. traumatized? No. And thanks for saying that because the word has been trivialized, commodified. It's good and it's bad at the same time. So let me give the correct interpretation of what trauma is. Trauma is when you've been exposed to a situation in which you perceived, thought, or actually could die. Where you were severely, potentially severely harmed. So it's a death encounter. It's not just you were driving down the road and someone, you know, did something cut in front of you, you got angry. That's not trauma. Trauma would be if you were driving down the road and whoever cut in front of you, it made it so dangerous that you felt oh, I could die. Because what happens with trauma is that the part of our brain that helps us to survive goes into high gear. It, it's called our fight or flight response because the body is always trying to survive. So when we have these encounters where we really came face to face with the possibility of our extinction, then that's strong. Yeah, and that, that and you know what? We don't use it that way. I hear people saying, well, you know, they're cursing around the kids. You have traumatized him or her, yes. you know? Yes. And and you're telling me now that when we use the term trauma, we're talking about death. Trauma is, some, is synonymous with almost dying or having died. Yes, and also, as was added in the psychiatric di diagnostic manual, when in cases of sexual violence. So those two conditions, when we were faced with a significant threat that could end our lives or any kind of sexual violence, that's clinically considered trauma. Now I know in, you know, everyday normal life, we'll say, oh, you know, it was traumatizing, but that's not to the extent where we are talking a clinical experience where our biology got changed and we have these stress hormones running around in our body trying to get us to either fight back in the situation, to run away if we can, or for sometimes to freeze. That's trauma. Because so if what, for a child, for example, for the work we've done in New Orleans, kids who are exposed to violence, who witness violence. In our studies over the year, kids have, we've surveyed, have said, 18% of kids have said they have seen someone being killed. That's trauma. Or they were in a situation where the killing was directed at them. That's trauma. Or they learned that a good friend of theirs, a parent, a someone close was harmed, was hurt, 
that's trauma. Or when first respondents go on the scene and they see horrific things, that's trauma. That's the clinical use of the word trauma from which you can then develop what we call trauma-based disorders. So, so you can develop. So it can PTSD. be trauma can be secondary in some instances. You can have a secondary experience. Yes. Yes. They, it's called vicarious trauma. Vicarious Where, trauma. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm learning some. I'm, that's why I like talking to small people like you, Doctor Shevington. I'm learning some some new things because I'm believing I'm gonna correct some people when they start using this. I'm, I'm gonna be the first to correct them vicarious trauma. So let me ask you this: What role does spirituality play in this whole equation of of um, being traumatized, clinically traumatized? Um, in in healing, what role does spirituality play in this whole mix, or does it have a role at all? Is it, or is it just purely science? No, it. I, you know, I don't know how we. We're the ones who are cutting up the experiences of ourselves. For some people, the construct of spirit, of essence, of the mystery of life. How did we come here? Is really very important. For some people. It's just like I'm here. None of that is that important. There's no right or wrong. For people for whom spirituality is important, it can be a source of healing. You know, to have a sense that there is something, a higher power, a greater being, or whatever that can help one through difficult times. For some people, that's really important. For some people, they don't have to, and they still are okay. So as mental health providers, we are here to support whatever pathways help someone to acknowledge and work through the pain that they're experiencing. So so I, I like the I like that word that you use. I like construct. Um mm-hmm. because construct implies that that it this is something that, that you put together in your own mind to exp- mm-hmm. That that is something that you built. So yes. so so, how does our mental constructs impact our day to day lives? How do the situations that we build or, or perceive? Because you also use the word perception, um, and we know that for some people, perception is. I used to always say perception is reality. You know, yes, that is whatever somebody believes. It doesn't necessarily have to be true. Is this whatever they believe? So how do our mental constructs help to shape? Uh, what we do and how we respond and how we react on a day-to-day basis? They, they actually, it's what is driving our experience of life. You know, we start with our physical body, the somatic space. This, we experience life through our physical body. And we also, our feelings, how we feel our consciousness is through our physical body, which is very much connected to the way we think about life and perceive life. And so every decision we're making, the things we're doing, is a reflection of what's going on in the relationship between what we're feeling in our bodies and how our mind is interpreting and perceiving what sensations are coming to us from the outer world through our physical bodies. That's what the mind is doing, is interpreting that. So everything about who we are is very much um, influenced by the way we think and the way we feel. So so with that being said, and I'm going to just pick your mind for a second, if you allow me to. Um, Mm -hmm. with, with that being said, then, then shouldn't, shouldn't we be in the best position physically to experience the world? If, if, if that's the way that we form our social construct. Absolutely. I mean, part of being well is to have the physical, what we consider a physical body is to do the most we can to optimize its well-being so the things we eat, the way we move our bodies, the way we relax our bodies, that's very, very important to our experience of life. And also to continually work on understanding how we think. We call the term mentalizing. To understand how we think, what's the connection between the feelings we have, the thoughts that get generated, and the way we act. 
and not only in ourselves because we're social beings. So the more we can mentalize about who we are is the easier it is to understand other people around us in our lives. It, part of it is in our conscious sphere and part of it we think is in the unconscious. Parts that we're not fully aware of, but if we spend a lot of time in quietude and in reflection, we begin to have a little better sense of what that part of our mind that is not always available to us, what's happening in there. You know, we have dreams, we, you know, those kind of things that usually we're not consciously aware of, but which might be forces that impact how we feel and think. So, Dr. Sherrington, people often say that we as African-Americans struggle with moving forward because we don't know exactly. Some of us can trace our roots all the way back to Africa, to our ancestors, but some of us may not be able to. So is 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 not knowing our origins, our our actual people um, being able to point to specific place and time. Is is that impacting our ability to move forward or does it matter at all? I think it's important. I don't think many of us have a sense individually of where those roots are, but we certainly have a sense collectively. And um, I I don't think not knowing, I don't know where the folks who were brought to um, to the Western world, I don't exactly know where they came from, but I know the experiences that they had. Um, And so that certainly helps me to understand the core beginnings of who I am and to understand all the forces that work for and against me. But I don't think we have to individually know this is exactly where my roots are. Some of us can, a few of us, but I think the majority of us don't. And I don't think it influences how we behave and act Um, how we think and feel, unless we are in denial about the collectivity of what that experience was. Okay, another question. So, so Dr. Sherr, are we born who we are, or is behavior learned? Can, can our, is our environment, what environment versus uh, our birth, are are we born the people that we are, and are going to naturally display the behaviors that we display, or, or is all behavior learned? I can just share with you the science as we know it right now is to suggest that who we are is very much influenced by the environment in which we live, interacting with our genetic hereditary material. That's as far as the science that we have the capacity to understand now. That's what it's showing us. So it's a combination of both. So we, we have to, the, the environment can can help to expose some of the genetic factors and traits that we already possess. Absolutely. And can enhance, you know, can expose them in positive or negative ways. And I think a lot of people um, struggle with that, you know, because we always talk about changing our environment, changing the behavior. But sometimes I'm gathering that, that even if you change the, be- the environment, the behavior may still stay the same. It can. It can. I think it's a really dynamic interchange. And what what we have the most capacity to do is to change our environment. So we should certainly try if, you know, we have the capacity to and their negative influences to try to change those as best we can. So in a few minutes, we have less, Dr. Shervington. What should we be focusing on because in during this particular time um, that we're spending a lot more time at home, um, a lot more time in isolation? What are the things mentally that we should be focusing on so that when this whole thing is over, we can come out in the best mental condition possible? I think it's really important to recognize that these are challenging times. These are very difficult times. These are times that... Um, you know, are a, I could say these times are traumatizing because we have an invisible threat to our existence. So that can create increased anxiety, increased fear, increased anger, increased paranoia. 
what we need to do is recognize that this is what happens when the body perceives a threat to its existence. What we then need to do is to learn how to manage these feelings, not to say they shouldn't be here because they're going to be here. But how do we manage them? How do we manage the anxiety? And for some of us, the grief, the loss we are experiencing. How do we manage the anger, the burst of anger we might have about just being upset about the situation we find ourselves in? So we have to become much more aware of our feelings, which means we have to spend a little more time paying attention to what's happening inside of us. Many of us just live from the outside, from the feel-good outside. This is not time to do that, or impulses, or quick desires, no. We have to spend time in solitude, learning more about who we really are, who are we truly, how will this experience, as you say, change us for the better, how will we make meaning, and most importantly, learn some techniques to manage these heightened emotions. Um, we in, no, go ahead. Finish. I'm sorry. I just wanted to share, and I think every time I come on, one of the most powerful tools we have to help us manage feeling anxious or frightened is our breath. During these moments, if we just stop, take a moment, take a deep inhale and exhale, and just become more aware of what, what's happening around me in my environment? What's going on in my body? You will be surprised at how much it helps to calm the body down and give us a better perspective of exactly what we need to do in any moment. We're talking to Dr. Denise Shervington, president of the Institute of Women and Ethnic Studies, who's also the chair of the psychiatry department at the Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science. We're talking about her podcast, The B-Sides, Healing is a Revolution. How can we follow you? How can we listen to your podcast and how can we follow you? We can, you can go online to iwesnola.org. All the information is there, I-W-E-S-N-O-L-A.org. The podcast is available on Spotify, Apple, Apple, and Google. And we just welcome people to make a commitment, a devotion to themselves to start a healing journey. We all need it at this point. None of us is spared from the anxiety and the tensions around us as we make it through this pandemic. Thank you so much. And I so look forward to our next conversation. I learn so much every time that we talk and I'm definitely going to be tuning in. Um, Lee, what a great what a great day we had. Um, Thank you. Man, I've been I've been getting in my therapy today. Um, I've had good conversation with Reagan. I'm, you know what, Lee? I'm learning to play well with others. That's what I'm learning. We appreciate you, Dr. Shervington. Uh, talk to you next you time. Um, yeah, I, I think, Lee, my takeaway is I think I'm getting better at playing well with others. Yeah, that was on my IEP, as my wife would say. <laughs> my individual evaluation plan that sometimes I don't play well with others. But, man, I play well with y'all. Because y'all show me love and I love y'all too. This is the Good Morning Show. We're signing out, but you don't have to go anywhere. You can keep it locked. Because coming up next, we got the Nutri Ground with Kelda Graylin and that boy Jazz. Um, you don't want to miss it. Always a great conversation coming to you from the Nutri Ground from the front porch right here on WBOK 1230 AM. What New Orleans is talking about. Talk to you tomorrow.